Sometimes I feel like we sort of treat Easter like it's a Christian Groundhog Day where we all gather together and see if that nice Jewish man is going to come out of his tomb again this year. And, and uh, we kind of take it for granted and, and we forget that if we are followers of Jesus, Easter is what it's all about. It's the day that changed everything. It's not just a day that we celebrate once a year, but it's actually an identity that we adopt. It's who we are. We're an Easter people. And I don't know how you can sing the song that we just sang without feeling like revival um, might break out among us today if we're not careful. So I'll try to tread lightly. Our scripture this morning comes from 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is... Freedom. Good. A few of you know that. Bonus points for the pastor. <laughs> it's a good verse. It's, it's simple. It's straight to the point. But it's also powerful. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's so good. This is a verse that I'm sure many of us are familiar with and that we've heard before. And this morning... There's a couple of simple truths that I want us to unpack together from this verse that we can apply to our faith and to our everyday lives. Now, I don't know if you guys have noticed this before, but one thing that we tend to do from time to time with Bible verses, especially ones that we like, is that we tend to take them slightly out of context. Have you ever noticed that before? Um, for example, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That is true. However... If you're a 45-year-old couch potato, you're probably not going to go outside and dunk a basketball with the strength that Jesus gives you. That's not exactly what that scripture means. So when we look at this scripture, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, I want us to put it into context this morning. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul isn't making a general statement about freedom found in God. He's writing a letter of encouragement and witness to the church in Corinth. And he's making a very specific point here. He's spelling out for the people how Jesus' death and resurrection have changed everything. He's talking about how before Jesus, there was always distance between God and his people. There was a barrier. There was a gap. There was something that separated them. The people of God were under the old covenant that we call the law of Moses. Now, the law of Moses was a rigorous and unforgiving rule book that was meant to keep people within the boundaries that God had given them. But of course, people being people, we added some things to it. We made it more difficult. And nobody could live up to the rules as they were set. And because nobody could fulfill the law of Moses, and because nobody could keep all of the rules, the people had this system of making sacrifices to atone for their mistakes and for their sin. But no one could fulfill the law. No one could keep all the rules, and so no one was righteous. And because no one was righteous, no one was able to be in the direct presence of God except for the chief priest, and only he got to do it one time a year. He went behind a special little curtain, and he came out, and he told the rest of God's people what God was up to. There was a disconnect between God and his people, and there was a barrier that separated them from one another. Have you ever felt separated from God? Have you ever had a time in your life where you felt like God was far away and that there was nothing that you could do to close that gap? A time where you felt as though no matter how hard you try, you just couldn't connect with God. Talk about loneliness. But then, in stepped Jesus. And everything changed forever. Because Jesus did not see equality with God as something to be held on to but he willingly chose to humble himself and to give that up and to come to earth and be born as a baby, a helpless baby, God as a helpless baby in a manger to an unwed teenage mother. And he lived the perfect life that we couldn't live and he died on the cross for our transgressions and he raised from the dead three days later. This is good news, amen? 
Because of what Jesus accomplished on our behalf, we're no longer under this law of Moses. We no longer have a list of rules as long as a CVS receipt that we have to follow in order to be in the presence of God. When Jesus rose from the dead, the veil that separated God from his people was torn forever. We no longer have to make sacrifices because Jesus was our once and for all sacrifice. We no longer need a chief priest to tell us what God's up to because Jesus became our high priest. Because of what Jesus did, you and I are able to know God. Do you ever just stop and think about how crazy that is? That you and I are able to know God. This is the freedom that Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And it's what makes our faith different from any other faith on the planet. Every other world religion is stuck on this system that relies on our own works in order to get to God. In Islam, you have to follow the five pillars. In Buddhism, you do the meditations of the Buddha, and all of them have different rules. But basically, you're trying to just let the good outweigh the bad on a scale, cross your fingers, and hope for the best. It's not so with our faith. Our faith is not about a set of rules and regulations. Our faith is about getting to know a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. When Jesus rose from the dead, a new covenant was established between God and his people. There's no longer this scale weighing out our good deeds and our bad. No matter who you are, no matter what your background or what mistakes you've made, no matter how long you've been separated from God, no matter what baggage or hurts or doubts you may have, you're free to be in the direct presence of the same God who spoke stars into existence. You're free to learn to hear the voice of the same God that called your name when you were in your mother's womb. You can share your deepest hurts, your biggest fears, and your worst mistakes with God and still be accepted by Him. No matter what, no exceptions, no ifs, ands, or buts, He'll accept you for how you are. Isn't that cool? Isn't that a good thing? You don't have to do anything because Jesus has already done it all for you. All you have to do is believe it and receive God's Holy Spirit. That's the freedom that Paul is talking about. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is this type of freedom. And the Spirit of the Lord is here this morning. And that freedom is here this morning. And it's available to you. God, I just, I ask right now that if there's anyone here who is stuck under this old law, God, that feels the weight of trying to do it all on their own. I ask that you'd set them free from that this morning, Jesus. If there's anyone that's carrying a burden that's too much for them, that's too heavy, I ask that they would give it up to you this morning, Jesus. If there's anyone here this morning, Lord, that feels far away from you, that's struggling to connect with you, I pray that you would help them to know that you're already here and that you love them. So God, help us to walk in this freedom let us connect with you this morning. We thank you and we ask for that in your name, Jesus. Amen. That's our first simple truth this morning from this verse. I want you to repeat this after me. Jesus set us free from the law. Jesus set us free from the law. Now, it doesn't stop there. That's just the first half. That's the first truth that's present in this verse. I want to take it a step further, but if I'm being honest with you, sometimes I think that we act like it does stop there. Sometimes we live a little bit and we do church a little bit like all there is to it is celebrating the fact that Jesus has set us free. And sometimes I think it's a little bit like this. Oh, thank you for joining us for Holy Week and Easter. Now we're going to go home. God bless you.
Have a great week. Have a great life. Whew, that was a busy week, Pastor. Amen. So, uh, Amen. What, what are we going to do now? I don't know. I got to un untangle cords and all kinds of... What do you mean, what are we going to do now? I mean, like, he is risen. Yeah, I mean, that was Easter. That's yeah. like the pep rally of the Christian year. What, right, but I mean... Are you a workaholic? I mean, do you need more than that? No, like, I mean, well, but if he's risen, what now? Well, we're going to celebrate Advent in late fall, and that will eventually take us to our Christmas Eve service. I, and by the way, I have some extra assignments for you. Oh, because of course we want you do. No, I just mean, I mean, if, if, if Jesus is risen and we believe that and it's, it changes everything, what do we do differently than before? I don't know. Oh, thank you. Is there more to your sermon? Stay tuned. Okay, good. <laughs> So if we're being honest, I think sometimes that's sort of how we approach our faith, and that's how we approach doing church and being the church. We have this giant Jesus pep rally on Easter, and we talk about how Jesus is risen, and he's risen indeed, and everyone's excited, but then what? What changes? Jesus has set us free from the law. That's great. We should celebrate that. We're not under that burden anymore. But what do we do differently? What does that change us? Or how does that change us? What has Jesus set us free for? The second half of that is that not only has Jesus set us free from the law, but Jesus has set us free from the law so that we can live by the Spirit. Jesus has set us free from the law so that we can then live by the Spirit. Now, what in the world does it mean to live by the Spirit? It means that every day we allow God to shape our priorities. That every day we intentionally spend time with Jesus, that we take steps closer to God so that we can look and be made more and more in the image of Christ. It means that we allow God to do new things in our heart, new things in our church, that we aren't satisfied with, well, this is just how we always do things, or we so-and-so usually does that, and we usually go here. No, it means that we say, God, what do you want to do? What are you up to? Lead me. Lead us. In Acts chapter 2, the early church um, is gathered together, and Jesus had just risen from the dead, and he appeared to the disciples and to Mary and and. He's ascended into heaven and he told him to gather in the upper room and to wait and to pray because he was going to send his Holy Spirit. And I think that sometimes churches are guilty of acting like the Holy Spirit never arrived. Sometimes I think that we gather together and we sing praise and we mean it and we believe that Jesus died and that he rose, but we act as though the Spirit was never sent and we're still waiting on God to do something else and to take the next step when really God's spirit was poured out long ago at Pentecost. A little bit later in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes like a, a violent thrashing wind and shakes the whole place where the disciples are gathered. And Peter stands up and he proclaims that a verse out of Joel has been fulfilled in the sight of all the people. And this is what he says. He says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy now, I know we hear that word, we think future telling, but a lot of times in the Bible when they say prophesy, they mean speak truth to power. Now, think about this. The littlest of your group will speak truth to the power, will speak truth to those in power. Oh, that's not very comfortable now. Hold on. The next thing he says is he says, your young will see visions. Now, this is an upside-down pyramid. So first we have the youngest people who are speaking truth to those in charge, and now... We have the young, so one step up, who are casting the vision for this whole thing? Wait a second. But then, he says, and your old will dream dreams. Your old will dream dreams. Those who have been a part of the faith for a long time will have new dreams, will be awakened to the God doing new things in their presence. Now, how does this all work? It works because the Holy Spirit is present, 
And because those present allow the Holy Spirit to move in freedom. They allow the littlest to speak truth to power. They allow the young to cast vision. And the young allow the old to dream new dreams. And we all work together to accomplish the task that God has given us. That's how it's designed. That's what it means to be church. Jesus didn't just set us free from the law so that we can celebrate and have a party once a year. He set us free from the law so that we can live every day by the power of the Spirit. Do you realize this morning that you have access to the same power every day that rose Jesus from the grave? Think about that. That's a crazy thing. You have access to the same power that rose Jesus from the grave. What else does it look like to live by the Spirit? Well, in 2 Corinthians 3, Paul actually tells us. In, I think, verses 12 and 13, he tells us that because our hope is not in what we've done, but our hope is in what God has done, that we live with boldness. When was the last time you heard a church described as bold? Hopefully, the churches are described as friendly or welcoming, or maybe that they have good music. A lot of churches are described as judgmental, as hateful, as the same people that have always been there doing the same thing they've always done. When was the last time we heard a church described as being bold? So what does it look like to live by the Spirit? It looks like allowing your faith to show up in ways that are new and different and bold. It looks like a lady named Miss Eva that lived uh, in Defuniac Springs, Florida when I worked at a church there. And Miss Eva was in her late 70s, and I made this announcement at church one Sunday about how the youth group was going to have a Disciple Now weekend. Now what that is, is it's basically a retreat without leaving town. So you have a couple of people in the church that volunteer to open up their homes, uh, one for the guys, one for the girls, and those are the host homes for the weekend, and they come to the church to play games and to have worship services and small group meetings. It's a wonderful thing. And so I made this announcement that, hey, we're doing this Disciple Now weekend. I need some host homes. And after church, Miss Eva, who I knew very well, came up to me and said, put me down for the boys. I said, Miss Eva, you go to bed at 7 p.m. every night. <laughs> that's, that's true, she did. And she said, I know, love, put me down for the boys. Are you sure? I, tr I really tried to talk her out of it. I did not think this was a good idea. And Miss Eva said, oh, I'll just take a nap. I thought, okay. So sure enough, that first night we had our worship service and our small group meeting. We get to Miss Eva's house. We roll up uh, about 11 o'clock at night, and the lights are off, and I'm thinking, oh, no. But as soon as I put that church van in park, here come the porch lights. Miss Eva greets everybody with fresh-baked cookies at 11 o'clock at night. The first night that we were in this lady's home, believe it or not, the teenage boys broke her sofa bed. They were wrestling around on it, and they broke it. And I was so ashamed, and I was so afraid to approach her. And I told her, and her response was, that's just stuff. That can be replaced. And I thought, who is this woman? <laughs> the next morning when I woke up, Miss Eva had made coffee for all of the teenage boys to their specifications. And then later on in the weekend, I used our free time to take a nap because I was exhausted. And when I woke up, Miss Eva was on the couch with the teenage boys watching their favorite comedian on Netflix and laughing at inappropriate jokes with them. <laughs> All she did was open up her home. But the difference that that made was amazing. Most of those kids in our youth group, they didn't come to church on Sunday mornings. Some of them never did. Some of their families did not go to church at all. But you know what happened? Every Wednesday night at dinner from that point on, the rest of the three years that I was at that church, all of those teenage boys, when they got to dinner, they made a trip over to Miss Eva's table and they gave her a hug and she gave them a kiss on the cheek and they talked about how school was going and they talked about their family and they confided in her and they let her pray for them and she discipled teenage boys at age 79 just because she was bold enough to say, 
I'll open up my home. What does it look like to live by the Spirit? It looks like that. It looks like asking God, what are you up to amongst us? And then getting out of the way and letting him have his way and partnering with him to make it happen, even if it's not our preference. Even if it means some things change about our physical property. Even if it means that we do things that we've never done, things that we're not sure are going to work. Will you be bold enough to allow God to move? Will you be bold enough to allow God's freedom to be in charge in your heart and in your life and in this place? One of my favorite Christian speakers and authors is a guy named Francis Chan. And Francis Chan, one of his critiques of the church in America is that so many of the churches in America could be completely without the Holy Spirit and nothing would change. They would just keep on with their programs. They would keep going along and maybe wouldn't even notice a difference. It's my prayer that we never become one of those churches. It's my prayer that we decide as a group to allow God to have his way, that we allow God to do new things in each of our hearts, in our families, in our Sunday school classes, and in our generation, and in this church. Sometimes it's hard, though, to allow God to do that. And sometimes the thing that holds us back is that we feel buried. Sometimes we, we don't allow God to have his way and we're not bold in our faith because we're dealing with a lot of hurt that we've never shared with anybody. Or because we're stressed beyond capacity. What I want you to hear this morning, if that's you, is that the enemy thought they had Jesus dead and buried also. But Jesus rose from the dead. And as it turns out, Jesus wasn't buried for good. He was just planted. And what grew when Jesus rose from the dead changed the world for all of time. So will you consider if you feel far away from God this morning, if you're having a hard time connecting, if you've been going through something that you haven't even shared with others, Will you allow God to bring something good out of that? Will you consider that maybe you're not buried for good, maybe you're just planted and that whatever springs out of that will allow you to impact people in Jesus' name? So this morning, as we get ready to close this service out, this altar rail is open to you. If you've been trying to do everything on your own and you need a new deal, God's here with a new deal. He says you don't have to be perfect you don't have to earn anything. You just have to believe and you have to let him have his way and he'll accept you. He'll give you new life. He'll heal you. He'll put together the broken pieces. Or if you've already done that, maybe even a long time ago, but your faith hasn't been as active as it should be or you haven't been growing, you haven't becoming more like Jesus, this altar rail is open this morning for you allow God to have his way with you and to deal with you. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And it's available to all of us this morning. Let me pray for us, and then we'll sing our closing song. Let's pray. God, as we close out our time of worship, I just ask that you would help us to be bold. That you would give us a faith that doesn't worry about our own personal preference, a faith that's bigger than how we've always done things. And God, even a faith that's bigger than our own imaginations because your imagination is far greater than ours. So Lord, help us to get out of our own way. Help us to allow you to have your way in each of our hearts, in this room, and in our church, God. So Lord, we praise you for all that you're doing amongst us, and we ask that we do our part to be faithful as you lead us. It's in Jesus' name and through his power we pray it. Amen.